Hey everybody, Larry Lawton here. I got a really good video. It's about the USP Atlanta riot. Uh, there was a documentary I saw and, and I was a little bit uh, confused or I heard different things. So I'm going to go over that documentary with you. It, it's going to be a really good video. Uh, it's about a place that I was at and we'll get into that in a little bit. Before I get started, please check us out on member programs, YouTube, Patreon, Discord. Uh, check my book out, Gangster Redemption. Great read. People love it. It's about prisons, about Atlanta, about a lot of places. So this will be pretty good. Now, let me, let me, let me tell you exactly what this is about. In 1987, there was a riot in Atlanta by the Cubans who took over the prison. I, I thought it was less than it, but it was for 12 days. Uh, I watched the whole documentary and there were things in there that confused me because I heard different from some guards. I actually worked for one uh, that was in that prison. So I'm going to go into this whole documentary. Now I'm going to move through it a little bit quicker than, than some of the stuff that I don't think is really pertinent. Uh, but I think it's, it's amazing that this happened and uh, goes to show you uh, what kind of a penal system we have in the United States. Obviously, these people, some of them were freed after this because they got an INS hearing. Uh, we know that now, and that's fact. So that, that's not, you know, we're not just saying that. So this is all fact. So the documentary kind of a little bit confused me, but there were parts of it that it brought back a lot of memories as well. So let's get into this video. It's going to be a real good video. It gave me chills, to be honest with you, because I was there, and it's such a scumbag place built in 1903. It's called United States Penitentiary, Atlanta. Matter of fact, if you look up the prison yourself right now, you're going to see I was one of the notable inmates there. That's that's pretty wild, too, when I saw that. But anyway, check it out, people, and uh, he, you're going to enjoy this. Let's start. Raging adrenaline and total anarchy, all within the walls of a federal prison. FBI tactical teams and negotiators work around the clock, trying to avoid a small-scale war and keep nearly 100 hostages alive. Now, this video, is a, it, it, it came from the FBI files, so uh, it, it, you can look it up online. It's a 49-minute video. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to go through the whole exact video because some of the stuff is... So, so, uh, what they did was they went into what they call Unicor, uh, is where the original riot started. Uh, Unicor is, they had factories. In, in Atlanta, we had three factories, and it still was the same place when I was there. I got to Atlanta in 97. This happened in 87, and I still, and I actually, I say, worked for a guard, uh, actually a food service guy named Perry. He was a really good dude, and uh, he ended up, I don't know, somebody told me he ended up having a stroke. But he was a really good dude. He was. He used to give a class to guards, uh, new guards coming in to say, like, treat these people normal because at any time this prison could be taken over. Obviously, he was a hostage for 12 days, and he told me how they took care of him and what happened there. That's why I'm going to refute some of the stuff here that, that was said. Uh, but they took over in, in the prison factories. That's called Unicor. In the factories, they made mattresses. Uh, they made uh, furniture. And they also made what they call BDUs, battle dress uniforms. Same thing back then. They made the same thing. It's a factory that I'm again not going to get into Unicorn in this video. It's something I dis disbelieve in. I wish they would just do it for certain things, but the government ends up fucking over people on the outside, and we know that all to be fact. Castro called them undesirables. The U.S. government called them detainees. In 1987, they staged a bloody revolt. Now the FBI and special operations teams must infiltrate a burning prison to stop the violence before it rages out of control. Now, uh, obviously, uh, in this uh, situation, there were 1,300 Cubans at the prison. There was 26, I think they said 26 or 2,700 inmates at the prison. Uh, and there was also a riot going on at Oakdale. Oakdale was in, I think, Louisiana. And they had a riot there because these Cubans were being held without any recourse to the courts or anything else, just as detainees after the Freedom Flotilla in 1980, which actually in 1981, I was part of that. I was part of the Coast Guard and I was helping in that. People always ask me, why do I have such a, a, a big heart for the Cuban people? Uh, because listen to me, I saw the, the humanity. I saw people trying to come here with their babies and kids 
to uh, flee a regime that was abusing people and uh, they were trying to get here on inner tubes and everything else and I saw a lot of death, a lot of destruction and I felt for the Cuban people. To this day, I really feel for the Cuban people and I got a big heart for Cuban people. Uh, the people themselves, administrations and governments, they're the big fucking criminals in most of this shit. I don't care if it's our government or the Cuban government or the Russian government. I do not hate the people in these governments, period, in any country. I think war is the biggest waste of, of, of human, human life ever, telling another kid to kill someone over some political bullshit. Now listen, if you're trying to take over our country and our way of life like it happened in the 1941 in Pearl Harbor and then you know Germany and, and trying to take over the world, I got it, I get it. But we're not talking about that anymore in this world. We're talking about trying to change regimes or change governments or change religions. And it never works, people. It just never works. Think about what I just said. Cuba, 1980. A plummeting economy and political unrest prompt Fidel Castro to allow Cuban citizens to leave the country for the first time in history. That's the kind of stuff that I was rescuing. And not only that, littler boats. I would see 27, year, 27 foot boats with 30 people and then a, and then a gasoline blow up and, and, and people are dying and I'm trying to rescue them. It, it, it messed my head up for a long time. And uh, I really, I have a really big feeling. People talk about all the incorrigibles. Let, they let out the criminals. That might be true. They let out the asylums. That might be true, but there were a lot, a lot of good people there. And I hate when people lump people into one group. That's not right, man. I don't want it done to me, and I hope you don't want it done to you. I don't want you to be judged on your mistakes or, or, or maybe a group that you hung out with. Yes, I get it, but uh, you shouldn't be judged like that for this situation or any situation. The notorious dictator permits American boats to enter Cuba's Mariel Harbor. In a five-month period, over 120,000 undocumented refugees flee the country, heading for Florida. 2,700 are considered criminals or mentally ill under U.S. law. Did you hear that? 2,700 are criminal or out of 120,000. So let's not just judge people, uh, especially the Cuban people, on any of this. You know, there's a lot of people that, that came here in the 60s and, and in the 80s even, and they're not bad people. Please, they're not bad people. The Attorney General instructs the Bureau of Prisons to find space for them in America's already overcrowded prison system. 1,000 Cuban refugees are sent to the Federal Detention Center in Oakdale, Louisiana. Nearly 1,400 are transported to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. You guys see that prison right there, everybody. That's my old prison. I, I've been there. Uh, I showed video of me there in front of it. Tell you what all the buildings are right there and uh, what, what the facility is about. So uh, if you have any kind of questions of Atlanta and, and me talking about this stuff, go back to that video. It's pretty cool, too. Uh, it's pretty interesting. For seven years, the U.S. and Cuban governments negotiate to send the criminals and mentally ill refugees back to Cuba. On November 20th, 1987, the State Department strikes a treaty with Cuba. Over 2,700 Cuban detainees will be sent back. You know, they don't tell you this here, even at the end, that they had 2,700 were going to be sent back. Well, obviously, after this, they talk about some being released. Uh, obviously, they, they shouldn't have been sent back, and, and we were going to send them back just without a hearing or whatever. And that's what this was really all about. Within 24 hours, Cuban detainees in both prisons get news of the decision. In Oakdale, Louisiana, a thousand of them riot, taking 28 prison guards hostage. But at the Atlanta penitentiary, all is quiet. See, I didn't know they did this in Oakdale uh, myself uh, at all. Uh, I, di I didn't know that. Uh, now I know it, and uh, now I see where it happened. But I could picture the tension in Atlanta. I could picture because I lived there. Early Monday morning, three days after the treaty is signed, prison employee Ted Manier arrives at work. He notices an eerie silence. Absolutely, you could feel tension. You, if you've ever been in a penitentiary, if you've ever been in an environment like this, I could feel tension. I'm sure this guy felt it too. You could feel the tension of that prison. You know something's not right. You've been doing this long enough. You've been in prison long enough. I could feel it. It's, it, it's eerie. 
It's not just what you see, you could feel it. You could feel it in the air. And normally it would be uh, full of inmates who were making a lot of noise and talking and there was hardly anybody in there. Now they're showing this guy with the gun. Obviously that's not true. Guards are not anywhere near that place with a gun. Uh, they're in the towers and that's it. Uh, they're not even looking like he's looking inside, so I didn't get that. Then they said there was some dramatic uh, stuff in this and I could see it now, right away. But in an instant, detainees overpower their guards and ignite fires. That could happen in a second at any time in any prison. In a matter of minutes, the riot spreads to the rest of the floors. I like the way the just door came off the hinges. That ain't happening. Uh, it might have fly open or something like that, but it's not going to come off the hinges that easy. Believe me, that those those hinges, I don't care where they are in prison, aren't just breaking that easy. Uh, but it does go to show me that they were well coordinated. They had this plan. It was and, and nobody snitched, so it was pretty good. But that's a penitentiary. Uh, people, there's a lot less snitches. They're there. But it's a lot less snitches than normal places. Of course, when this happens, they lock down everything else. They try to get everybody else out. But they ended up getting 100 hostages. Think what I just said, 100 hostages. The guard I knew pretty well, his name is Perry. He was one of them. We had staff members in 11 towers that had very good observation over the entire outside compound who logged those employees that they recognized in those areas. Yeah, they had to get track of everybody. You know, you got a prison this big uh, and, and this many employees and this many inmates, there's people everywhere. Uh, obviously the towers, you know, those towers, people don't even notice they're locked. You can't get up in that tower unless you're let in to that tower. In fact, nobody has a key to that tower. They drop down a bucket with the key to open it when they know who that is. That's how that works. So there's nobody can get into that tower. Nobody, and unless they let somebody in. I'm sure there's a master key in case the guy dropped dead up there. I'm sure of that. But there's not like a key on the complex, so, you know, going around. They, have, they actually, if you see them, you go to a penitentiary to this day, you'll see them drop down a bucket, and then the bucket will have what it is in there, and the key to get in the place to open it up to get up in that tower. Because once you're in that tower, boy, you want to talk about, wow, you got observation, you got the rifles, you got everything. You're ready to go. We started a list of the officers that we thought were hostages. Now again, it's not only officers that are, are hostages, medical personnel, there's food service personnel, there's uh, the uh, workers in the, in the industry factories. Now, they're all not labeled guards. It could be different like uh, kind of employees, teachers and stuff of that nature are not uh, labeled as guards. They have guards, but then, and this guy keeps talking about his guards. I get it. But uh, what about the other people? Ted Manier and his colleagues are trapped inside an equipment cage in the Burning Industries building. Several rioters try to convince the Cuban detainees guarding the cage to unlock the door. You see, they, they were protecting certain people, uh, and that's what I was told happened. The, uh, my, my guy, Perry, told me that what happened, he was actually protected by certain people because he respected, they respected him and they did the right thing. Now, he told me, and they don't say it in this, that they abused one guy and his, and his wife because they hated him and they did it right in front of each other. And uh, they, don't, they said, oh, nobody got hurt. That's bullshit. Maybe nobody got killed, but nobody, you know, people got fucking traumatized and messed up for sure. But the raging fire threatens to destroy the building. So the rioters are forced to move their hostages to another part of the prison complex. There was a guy that was up ahead of me, and he got hit. I, I remember seeing him. He was a Cuban. He got hit right behind the ear. I talked to you about this before. They do shoot down on the yard. I, obviously, in this, I didn't know they shot one of the uh, inmates uh, uh, here, that's pretty pretty good shooting if you ask me because that tower is a long way off. Trust me, that's a tower is a long way off and those guys must be pretty good shots. Uh, but after that, they let them know, man, anything happens here, we're going to kill everybody. So at this point, they didn't even know what was going on. I was getting worried because the bullets were going pretty close around where we were. Chaos reigns as guards and detainees run for cover. They ran us across to the corner of the building where they couldn't shoot at us. You know, there was a spot where I worked in the East Yard. There was a corner like that where you couldn't get seen by one of the uh, uh, towers. Uh, that's where I told you the guys would uh, 
try to freaking open the fence and do shit. And I don't know what they were going to do because after you went through the fence, there was a tower there. So, I mean, you couldn't see it right where that part was. They call them blind spots. Less than an hour after the riots begin, FBI agents from the Atlanta field office arrive at the penitentiary. The FBI has jurisdiction over criminal matters in all federal prisons. I knew that, that uh, the FBI has jurisdiction inside any federal institution uh, for any, any crimes. That's why you can actually be charged with a crime federally if you're in an institution and you kill somebody or even cell phones or whatever it is, you can be charged federally. The detainees have taken the guards' radios, compromising prison communications. Obviously, detainees are going to take everything from keys to, keys to the radios or whatever they can. And, uh, and I'm going to implore everybody, since I'm, I'm going through this a little bit quicker than normal, is to watch the video. So you'll see where I'm coming from when I watched it and what I saw. Obviously, this is an FBI take. I'm giving you my take as a person who was in that prison and knew people. I actually knew people who were in the prison when it happened. And I also knew uh, a guard, again, a work from Perry, who was a hostage in that prison. They wanted me to get emotionally involved with them. And these four that originally came out to talk to me really were only speaking for themselves they were not speaking on behalf of the 1400. You're gonna see how the, the uh, FBI actually went through all the records of the people to see who had the power and stuff like that. And th that's amazing that they went that deep into this, uh, not just going off, off cock, because they knew they're gonna, it, listen, something goes wrong there, they kill all 100 people, period. These people don't care, they don't have nothing to lose. Uh, think about that, you know, the worst person you can deal with is a person who has nothing to lose. Person has nothing to lose, they're very dangerous. Always remember that. In the command post, Warden Petrovsky receives a frantic call from 16 employees who have barricaded themselves in cell block E. E block is home to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary's most dangerous criminals. These particular group of inmates were locked away and E to keep them from harming someone. If the detainees get into cell block E and free the inmates, the lives of all 16 employees will be in danger. Obviously, that's the whole, uh, and uh, you're going to see when they get them out and who they let out. And I talk about it on this channel before, uh, and boy, but they don't tell exactly what I knew and people who told me what happened with him there. I did not know how they got him out, and that's going to be pretty interesting near the end. The E cell block is also home to the prison system's most notorious inmate, Thomas Silverstein. A number of people in the Bureau of Prisons told me that he singularly was the toughest prisoner they believed that the Bureau of Prisons had ever housed. You could look him up, uh, Tommy Silverstein. I used to see the artwork that uh, come out of a prison, a friend of mine did uh, when he was in Leavenworth. I saw the cell they kept him in after this. They had a special cell down below the uh, uh, movie theater and the old chow hall. They had it below that. It, a guard showed me that. I also seen the tunnels, and I've been in the tunnels in this prison. They're going to show you in this uh, uh, video here. And when you watch the video itself, the whole video, you're going to see the tunnels. I've been in them. I've been in them with the CMS. I had to go down there for some stuff to help them with some uh, carry stuff back. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's real eerie and the rats and the fucking, I mean, I mean, you know, real rats, fucking big ass fucking rats. That's where old Big Ben came from or lived. And I talked about him. But uh, yeah, I saw his cell. Tommy Silverstein was one of the founders of the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, one of the most baddest ass motherfucker. Killed guard, killed Cadillac uh, in the hole. In the hole, he did that. So it is, you're talking one of the most badass prisoners who was, and he is what he was under what they call no human contact. Which, if that doesn't make you crazy, nothing fucking would. They believed that they could go over the wall, out of view of the rioting detainees, and retrieve those people out of that building successfully. You know, when I see the outside of this prison like this, it drives me crazy because it, 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 it just brings back memories of going in at the Sally Port, where it is around the back on the sides, everything. It just, it kind of, you know, I, it, it's a fucking eerie place. When I was in that place, I didn't see a vehicle because you can't see out where I was. I can't see out at all. I haven't seen a, I didn't see a vehicle for two years. Uh, literally never a vehicle of any sort. Uh, you just don't. The SWAT team will need ladders to get over the 40 foot high wall. Special Agent Blakeney calls on the Atlanta Fire Department. 
They said in this video, you, I won't put it there, but the video says uh, that the wall was 40 feet high. We knew that. I said three feet thick. They said three yards thick, which is nine feet thick, uh, which is just think about that. I mean, it, it's just uh, you, you can't get through that. It's, there's no getting through that. I don't think you can blow that fucker up. That, that, that's like shit for war. Uh, crazy, crazy place. We put a helicopter up. Uh on the opposite side of the prison to attract their attention and uh, at least have some diversion. Seven hours after the riot began, the FBI SWAT team launches a daring mission to rescue 16 prison employees without endangering the lives of nearly 100 hostages. It's amazing that they actually did this. This is something I didn't know either, that they did get in and then get out with these these prisoners, uh, these hostages as well. Again, they didn't get to the 100. They got, I guess they were more all locked in wherever they could lock themselves in because obviously they had a medical staff here. And when you watch the video, you'll see that. So this is just a crazy video that, I mean, more stuff I I don't know, but it brought back memories when they showed the cell block or some of it exactly the way it was. The cells were like that. We had different doors, though. We didn't have the doors they did, uh, and I'm sure they just changed those doors. Uh, but it's the way it's set up with the tiers and then a, a tier on the top because I was on the top tier of, of A1. You could almost feel the energy of those rioting prisoners. Colson started the FBI's hostage rescue team. I mean, you got to remember the BOP was stretched. They had a whole team of people, and the FBI had a team of people at the Oakdale riot because there was two riots going on at the same time. Again, I didn't know that as well. So, I mean, this was a little educational to me. We had SWAT teams from all around the country, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, as well as, of course, the immediate uh, surrounding area. We figured that based on the capability we had, we were probably maybe an hour away from getting in to rescue the hostages. We were all concerned that that, that they started killing hostages. We, we were helpless. They were helpless from the from the jump start, uh, knowing the prison set up and know the way it is if they tried to get in there. I, I mean, especially if you got psychopaths doing things. Uh, I would never do that, and I never intend would intend. I, just not me. But you want the truth. If, if you're there, you don't know what you would do. Uh, you don't know what the situation itself w would develop into. And uh, obviously, you know, as a leader myself, I think I would try to uh, get something. I don't know. They, these guys wanted hearings, and, and uh, you can't blame them for that. They were being held without any kind of charges or anything like that. They're just detainees, and that's got to be rough. Come on, man. I, I think I would be considering a war zone and try to escape try to do something like they're doing. I mean, really, if I was in another country and this happened, I think I would do the same thing. They started negotiating with, with, with a, a group that they they picked out that were leaders, and then, and they did something smart I didn't know. They also gave mail that built up over some days, and that was like a big thing, getting something. Obviously, that's always good. Uh, they had all the food and water and everything. In, in the video itself, they said they had a food for a year. So, I mean, you know, if you want to really take this place over, you got food for a year, what are you going to do? They got water, obviously, and uh, so th they have what they need to survive in that place on their own. Obviously, you know, always on guard. But when you have people's lives at stake like this, you got to think of what you're going to do because these people cut their heads off, and they would. I mean, and you got, now you got Tommy Silverstein running around the prison. Remember, he's now... Uh, looking out for ways to escape. What they don't say here, I'm gonna tell you happens in a minute. Hospital workers are moments away from becoming hostages, or worse. They let the hostages in the, in the medical be taken because they knew if they tried to rescue those people just themselves, they, they might cause the whole other hundred to die. Uh, and that's what I find out later, they ended up getting a, a cocktail for Tommy Silverstein. Outside the prison, crowds gather. Families of the hostages, the prison guards, and even the detainees wait for information about their loved ones. I mean, I actually remember this in 1987 when it happened uh, as, as a civilian outside. I was like, you know, just really getting into crime heavy myself, but uh, didn't know I'd ever be there, obviously. Uh, not a place you want to be either. Whilst literally screaming at us, if you want to assault us, go ahead. As soon as you do, we're setting fire to these men. 
How much do you think those people were really shitting? I mean, they put gasoline on them and had lighters and said, if you want to fucking attack this prison, we're just going to burn these people. And believe it or not, they would have. I'm surprised no accident happened, to be honest with you, in this whole prison. Because there's really nobody in control. It's not like there's one person, like it was a general or a, a, a leader of this group that's really in control. I mean, this is fucking... How can you control maniacs? You really can't. Uh, but... It, it, it just, it, it blew my mind that, you know, nobody ended up really getting killed at the end. At the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI agents negotiate with Cuban detainees who have taken over the prison. The lives of nearly 100 hostages hang in the balance. Now they keep negotiating with the people. Now they know now that Tommy Silverstein is on the loose. Listen to this. This is how crazy this video got. Tommy Silverstein is on the loose and they know how crazy he is. He'll kill people and he wants to escape. What they don't tell you here, and I know from other inmates that were there and even the guard, Tommy Silverstein was trying to get together a kite to, to fucking fly over the wall with a fucking, from a building top. That's what he was trying to do. He wasn't just sitting there like they're showing in this video. Him sitting on a chair watching shit and everything else. He was fucking, he was feared by everybody. He was feared by the Cubans. He was feared by everybody. In fact, you're going to hear how they ended up fucking getting him and it blew me away. But uh, that's, you know, kind of what they did. They negotiated to get Tommy Silverson out of their custody. In other words, they manipulated the Cubans who were controlling the thing to give up Tommy Silverstein because they were so feared that he would start killing people and he was going to escape. They didn't even say it here, but they didn't know that he was trying to get a kite over the fucking wall from one of the high buildings. There's buildings all over that place. So, I, I mean, I, I could just see that. It's fucking just thinking about it makes me think, wow, how crazy can you be? Because those walls are high. I mean, I know what they're like. I watch guys put ladders on fences, try to get over, and I've seen all that. So this this is just blew me away. And uh, they don't say that here, but that's what happened. And also, how they got them really blew me away. So let's get towards that. The rioters are working 24 hours a day, making weapons by the thousands. There's all kinds of steel inside the, uh, the prison, and they're very resourceful with the equipment, the ground weapons and the spears. I want you to look at this too. Look at the shanks they're making. And now they have, you gotta remember something. These guys now have fucking machinery. Colson and Blakeney go back into the tunnels underneath the prison. One of the tunnels leads to the prison's electrical room. It's located right outside the American dorm where most of the hostages are held. See, there they were in the tunnels. You just saw before that they were in the tunnels uh, uh, trying to get Silverstein or trying to... They really wanted him. He was the most. But the tunnels under there is massive, man. There's so many tunnels under the prison for piping and, and, and ventilations and everything else. Uh, you can't get through them because they actually go lower. And when you're down there, and I was in the tunnels, there's like a, like a steel cage door you can't get through. It's fucking padlocked and everything else. You couldn't break through that thing if you're fucking at anything. You, you, you couldn't get through it. So they had that. So underneath, and again, I told you, I was down there. It was fucking eerie and fucking damp and rats and all that fucking shit. I mean, it's some serious crap there. Rosario tells the rioters that until Silverstein is back behind bars, the hostages are in grave danger. As long as the vicious killer roams free, the standoff could come to a sudden and violent end. See, now they have Silverstein just hanging out in a chair, looking at shit. That's, no way would he have done that. That guy was too clever to do anything like that. That guy got out of a prison cuffs and killed two people in the hole. You know, that's not so easy to do. So, you know, I don't buy that at all. I know it's a dramatization, but I don't buy that. More than a week into the intense standoff with Cuban detainees at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI negotiators worry that a dangerous American prisoner could jeopardize a peaceful end to the conflict. That is true. He would jeopardize that. But And here's what they ended up doing, and uh, I did not know this. After negotiating uh, to turn Silverstein in, these inmates, even these Cubans, didn't know how to get him. He's a fucking killer. He'd kill everybody. 
So here's what they do, and they're gonna tell you how they get them, and it, and it blew me away how they got them. Detainees tell agents how they captured Silverstein. So they gained access to the pharmacy, they took some narcotic, they put it in a can of uh, fruit cocktail, which he was known to like, and fed him fruit cocktail laced liberally with this drug, which in effect knocked him out. Think of how they did that. They actually figured out a way to get Tommy Silvers. They, they wouldn't just jump him. He was going to kill somebody. Uh, he was always ready, I'm sure. And he was really trying to do things. And that I was told by multiple people trying to get out uh, with a kite and all this crazy shit. But that's how they got him. They actually laced food to get him and knock him out. That's how crazy that fucker was. And the Cubans even figured out some other way to do that. They ended up then freaking turning themselves in. And all they got out of it, which was okay, is they got hearings. They got independent hearings for all the detainees. And some of them were set free. So when you see that they're set free, you got to say, wow, those people were in there for 10 years, never did a thing. You know, I mean, when you did uh, 18 years, I think it was 18 years, yeah, since 1981, they were in there. And here is uh, 81, so seven years. So whatever. And, and they didn't do anything. So think about that. So this video ended with that, that they did end up getting them uh, negotiating and doing all that. And it was a 12 day standoff. Uh, they say nobody got hurt, but of course the one inmate was killed, they show you that. Uh, no hostages, I'm, I'm assuming they're saying got killed, but I know one that was abused. And also uh, uh, five others were shot too. So, but there was more other abuses and everything going on, because that's when the, things go crazy. People hate other people. What the guard told me, Perry, he goes, listen, I tell people every day, he goes, listen to me, treat people like you'd want to be treated or your parent would want to be treated or if it was your dad in here because what you do to an inmate as you're a guard uh, if you do something to him he's never going to forget it and if the fucking chain if, if this the uh, the situation is flipped he don't forget that you fucked with him did whatever and all of a sudden now he's got the freaking power and it can get real bad because he don't give a shit anyway but that is an, the actual story of the Atlanta prison riot. I talk about sometimes, I didn't know this. Somebody sent it to me, so I wanted to check it out. And I'm thankful, thank them for sending it to me. I appreciate all your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Listen, we're doing a lot of things. Keep watching, keep subscribing. Please pass these on. Thanks for your support. I really appreciate it. Much love, much respect. Thanks again. Have a great day, everybody.